Hey there, it's the Matt Forgot That Podcast, the place to recollect and reminisce. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to rewatch and review a movie or TV pilot that I've seen before but don't quite remember. It could be a blockbuster, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've reviewed or want to share your own trip down memory lane, use the hashtag MattForgotThat on social. Before we start, I've been celebrating Halloween and the horror genre all this month on the Matt Watch That and Matt Forgot That podcasts, but I gotta be honest, I wasn't feeling Halloween this year, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because up until a couple of days ago, it was still around 80 degrees outside. But whatever the reason, I usually like a costume that celebrates the anniversary of a film. In the past, I've done Doc Brown from Back to the Future, Alan Grant from Jurassic Park, Hannibal Lecter from The Silence of the Lambs. But as I was going through the movies that came out 30, 40, 50 years ago, nothing was jumping out at me. Then I decided to try films that were turning 25 and came across A Night at the Roxbury, probably the most successful SNL film since Wayne's World, I decided to dress up as Will Farrell's character, Steve Butabi. I even downloaded What is Love by Hathaway and practiced my head bob. But it got me to thinking that I haven't watched Saturday Night Live consistently since the Will Farrell era, with Molly Shannon, Daryl Hammond, Anna Gasteyer, Tracy Morgan, and Chris Kattan. Prior to that, I was all on board. There were so many memorable characters and sketches. Wayne and Garth, Mr. Robinson, Linda Richmond, Mary Catherine Gallagher, The Church Lady, Delicious Dish, Matt Foley, Goat Boy, Debbie Downer, Gene Frankel of Blue Oyster Cult. The Jeopardy sketches never fail to make me laugh, though Stefan has some of my favorite bloopers, and it's great when they break character. I've caught a couple of episodes here and there during the Kristen Wiig, Maya Rudolph, and Bill Hader cycle. And I'll watch it if I like the guest host. But one season, they announced the new cast members. And I was like the Cleveland fans who looked at the roster for the Indians in Major League. Who are these f- Whoopsie! Guys. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It. Two stars Watch at Your Own Risk. Three stars Standard Fair. Four stars Worth Checking Out. And five stars Must See. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. In this episode of the podcast, I'm re-watching and reviewing The Craft from 1996. It was directed by Andrew Fleming, who helmed Comedy Dick, Family Mystery Nancy Drew, and episodes of Younger, Uncoupled, and Emily in Paris, where he was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Comedy Series in 2021. The screenplay was co-written by the director and Peter Filardi, who scribed the science fiction thriller Flatliners, and co-created the horror series Chapelweight. It stars Robin Tunney, who appeared in Empire Records, End of Days, and Encino Man. Feruza Balk made her film debut in Return to Oz as Dorothy, and was cast in American History X, The Waterboy, and Almost Famous. Nev Campbell starred in Party of Five, and would shoot to stardom in the Scream franchise. Rachel True is best known for Half-Baked, and the series Half and Half. This is what I remember. The movie is about witches. They cast spells. Also, it's another movie that I distinctly remember watching for the first time. It was a group of my friends. We were watching on an old school television. I'm talking about turn the channel with a knob old school. Like it was 15 years out of date when we were using it. We were in the den. I can't remember whose house, but we enjoyed it. The girls were a little more enthusiastic about it than the guys. 
Now I'm heading off to watch the movie. This is what I forgot. The chant, light as a feather, as stiff as a board. As soon as I heard that, a bunch of memories started flooding back. And then you have the supporting cast. Skeet Ulrich, who would co-star with Nev Campbell in another 1996 hit, Scream. Brecken Meyer is his sidekick, Mitt. And Christine Taylor plays mean girl Laura Lizzie. So let's jump into it. At a high school in Los Angeles, three teenagers are rumored to be witches and are social outcasts, drawing the ire of their classmates. Nancy Downs is their spiritual leader who wears gothic clothing and proudly embraces the gossip. Bonnie Harper is reserved and insecure about scars she received in a house fire. Rochelle Zimmerman is the target of bullying and racism on the swim team. 16-year-old Sarah Bailey has recently relocated from San Francisco with her father and stepmother. She's considered a troubled youth who had attempted suicide and experiences hallucinations. She stands out on her first day of school because she's without the standard uniform. While in class, she's noticed performing a trick with a pencil by Bonnie, who believes Sarah could be the missing part of their coven. In their occult almanac, it's said that today will bring an arrival of something, a new wholeness, and with it, a new balance. Earth, air, water, fire. You see, they need a fourth person in their party to call out the corners. North, south, east, and west. After school, she's approached by Nancy, Bonnie, and Rochelle, and come to the realization that she's a natural witch. Her power comes from within. They convince her to join their coven and take revenge on the people who have wronged them. But they need to heed the warning. Whatever you send out, you get back times three. Here's a quote without context. Since I was a little girl, all I've ever wanted in life was a jukebox that played nothing but Connie Francis records. The Craft is a spellbinding movie. It feels very 90s, but it's not completely dated. The clothing does reflect that time, though it's aged better than big hair and neon spandex from the 80s. Jeans and t-shirts don't go out of style, at least according to Taylor Swift. Now, the alt-rock soundtrack does give that post-grunge vibe. It works in the context of the film, but does peg it to the mid-90s. Some of the direction and editing choices felt more appropriate for a music video than a feature film. The special effects also don't age that well, though I was impressed by a spell that was cast upon Christine Taylor's character. That was all makeup and practical effects. It looked very convincing. The movie seems like two halves of an idea put together. The first half is fairly typical high school drama with bits of comedy and fantasy. The second half turns darker as the friends' powers consume them. I think the message of the film is to find the power within yourself to overcome your insecurities. And maybe don't betray witches. Now for a little trivial trivia. The filmmakers aimed for a PG-13 rating, but the MPAA gave it an R due to the amount of witchcraft performed by depicted teenagers. The craft was produced by Douglas Wick. It was shot at Verdugo Hills High School, Leo Carrillo State Beach, Chateau Bradbury Estate, all around the Los Angeles area. The cinematography was captured by Alexander Grzynski, whose filmography includes Tremors, 54, and a couple of Tyler Perry films. It was edited by Jeff Freeman, who worked on Cruel Intentions, Glitter, Nancy Drew, Paul Blart Mall Cop, Ted, and its sequel. The score was composed by Graham Revel, who wrote the music for The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, The Crow, Street Fighter, Spawn, The Negotiator, and Laura Croft, Tomb Raider. The soundtrack features songs by Sponge, Our Lady Peace, Jewel, Letters to Cleo, and Susie and the Banshees. The runtime is 1 hour 41 minutes. It had a budget of $15 million and grossed $55 million at the box office. A sequel, The Craft Legacy, was produced by Blumhouse Productions, which was written and directed by Zoe Lister-Jones. On the Ski Index, I give it 3.5 out of 5 stars. If you've seen The Craft and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattForgotThat. Moving right along. Each episode, I'm going to post throwback clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there'll be a playlist called Matt Forgot That Playback. 
Garbage Pail Kids were a set of trading cards that featured grotesque drawings and punny named characters, parodying another 80s phenomenon, Cabbage Patch Kids. It was created by Art Spiegelman for Tops, cartoonist Mark Newingarden was brought on board as editor, and John Pound was responsible for conceiving the outlandish designs. First issued in 1985, they were an immediate success behind personas like Adam Bomb, Bad Breath Seth, Mad Donna, and Acne Amy, leading schools to start banning the trading cards for distracting students. In 1987, a live-action film, The Garbage Pail Kids Movie, was released in theaters. It was directed by Rod Amato and starred Mackenzie Astin, son of Patty Duke and John Astin, and brother of Sean. He was a teen idol, starring in The Facts of Life when he was cast in the movie, which was his feature film debut. Captain Manzini was played by actor, singer, songwriter Anthony Newley. He won a Grammy Award for Song of the Year for What a Fool Am I. He was nominated for an Academy Award for the film score of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, featuring the tracks Pure Imagination, I've Got a Golden Ticket, and The Candy Man, which became a signature song for Sammy Davis Jr. Upon its premiere, it almost instantly bombed and was universally panned. It's considered one of the worst films ever made. I would love to say that this movie is so bad it's good, but it's beyond that. It's so bad, it's horrific. And I appreciate how awful a movie this is. It's totally lowbrow, gross-out humor, all bodily functions represented. But it does give me hope that my films will get produced one day. A short-lived television series was produced in 1987 and ran for one season, 13 episodes, in the United Kingdom. It was pulled from the CBS lineup after complaints from the Action for Children's Television, the National Coalition on Television Violence, and the Christian Leaders for Responsible Television. I thought conservatives weren't for cancel culture. Like many fads from the 80s, the popularity waned by the end of the decade, but with nostalgia on the rise, new sets of trading cards started to be released in 2010. In 2012, a CGI version was greenlit by Michael Eisner after his company purchased Topps Trading Cards, but the production was cancelled a year later. A new animated series was announced in 2021, produced by Danny McBride for HBO Max, but I haven't been able to find any additional information on it. Hey, this is a Matt after the fact. I was putting the finishing touches on this episode, and an article just came out about the new Garbage Pail Kids series. According to David Gordon Green, it's not dead yet, and it looks like instead of being a family-friendly show, it's going to be a little naughty, pending HBO Max's approval. So we'll see what happens. But that's the latest. I've selected a few videos that give some insight to the Garbage Pail Kids phenomenon. They're all available in the Matt Forgot That playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a nostalgic movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Tales from the Dark Side. Created by George A. Romero, iconic director of Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, and Creepshow. It's an anthology series that features a short horror story, typically ending with a twist, that explores the things that go bump in the night. The opening title sequence includes a creepy voiceover, accompanied by a synth-heavy theme song, with a montage of images of spooky forests and abandoned buildings, similar to The Twilight Zone, Night Gallery, and contemporary Tales from the Crypt, a bevy of actors have taken trip to the dark side, like Darren McGavin, Carol Kane, Danny Aiello, Bruce Davison, John Hurd, Jerry Stiller, Phyllis Diller, and Abe Vigoda. Behind the scenes, writers Stephen King, Michael McDowell, and Clive Barker contributed scripts, while episodes were directed by Tom Savini, Bob Balaban, and Jodie Foster. One of my favorites is from season one, called Anniversary Dinner. It stars character actors Mario Racuzzo and Alice Grossly. As a couple living in the mountains who are preparing to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary, when they're visited by Sybil, a hiker that they invite to stay with them. The story is predictable, and it's not in the least bit scary, but those two facts add to how good the episode is. 
where those involved are still able to pull off a compelling and convincing tale. While this one leaned on more comedy, the show does cross genres from horror and suspense to science fiction and fantasy. Some of the stories are constrained by the budget and shows a little wear and tear over time, but it's still very effective filmmaking. In 1990, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, was released in theaters. It was directed by John Harrison and featured segments written by Michael McDowell, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Stephen King, and George A. Romero. It starred Debbie Harry, Matthew Lawrence, Christian Slater, Steve Buscemi, Julianne Moore, and my acting coach, Rob Sedgwick. The budget was $3.5 million and grossed over $16 million at the box office. A sequel was announced soon after, but never came to fruition. A reboot of the anthology series was produced for the CW in 2014, but the pilot was not picked up. Tales from the Dark Side was on for four seasons, 94 episodes from 1983 to 1988. That's all for this edition of Matt Forgot That. Thanks for listening to me reminisce. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've reviewed, or want to share your own trip down memory lane, use the hashtag MattForgotThat on social. Head over to mattsaroski.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the rewatch and the review. Linda Richmond, Mary Catherine, G- Mary Catherine, Mar- It was edited by Jeff Freeman, who worked on Cruel Intentions, Glitter, Nancy Drew, Paul Bart, Mark Lop, Bar- whoa. 16-year-old Sarah Bailey has recently relocated from San... 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 It's like I left my brain in San Francisco.